Welcome to The Truth in His Art, your go-to source for conversations at the intersection of arts, culture, and community. I am your host, Rob Lee, and I am thrilled to have you with us today. My next guest is a multidisciplinary artist, curator, and award-winning filmmaker whose work explores the histories of Black culture in the South and the African diaspora through the lenses of folklore, fantasy, and hidden histories. Please welcome Imani Dennison. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Rob. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for for coming on. It's like, you know, truly a welcome, you know, sort of like opportunity and, you know, filmmakers. That's one thing. You know, I like talking to filmmakers. It's like there's like a list. It's like, you know, I like talking to everyone. I you know get the privilege to talk to. It's highly curated. Right. But when I'm talking to photographers, when I'm talking to filmmakers and when I'm talking to chefs, it's just like Ooh. a different energy that comes over. I'm like, go on, because you guys are living the lives mm. I could have lived. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, I think your platform, um, also learning a new language of code and also just hosting, being in conversation with us is a, is a great pleasure, honestly, an honor. So, no, nah, thank you for, for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. Most, most, most appreciated. Um, so before we go into like the main, main questions, I want to invite and encourage you to to introduce yourself in your own words. You know, we, we get these. I, I, I came up with this question a little while ago and I keep tweaking it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you saw American fiction, I'm assuming. I did see American fiction. <laughs> and, and there's this piece in there about that I took from like categorization. And it's just like, oh, you're this, you're that. And I've been de deemed as the black podcast that does this, this and this. I was like, I don't think I have signed off on that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more important to hear it from, you know, our own words. That is a piece of it for me, but it's not the only piece. So yeah. could you introduce yourself and briefly tell us about your work? It's a little bit of a little bit of a taste. Yeah, for sure. Uh, my name is Imani Dennison. I am a multidisciplinary artist, uh, primarily working in the mediums of photography, film. I'm programming. I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky, or Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky. If you know, you know. Uh, I'm currently based between both Louisville and Brooklyn, New York, Flatbush to be exact. I am also working, um, you know, as a filmmaker, in the modality of documentary. I love documentary filmmaking. I love doc. Um, also, my photo-based works are also really rooted in uh, documentary practices. I love street photography. I love working with people. I love portraiture. Um, I love really just exploring Blackness in, you know, the vast beauty of the diaspora, I've traveled throughout the continent of Africa, you know, collaborating and building and documenting histories and reimagining and like exploring with my own imagination. And um, yeah, I'm doing a lot of that work here too on the ground. And uh, that, yeah, that's that's my practice. That's me. Thank you. It's um. It's it's good to hear hear those details, what have you. Um, and it's already given me an extra rapid fire question because it's like <laughs> you'll, you'll see me. I'm, I'm like typing. I'm looking. I was like, I got something. Extra. It's like uh -oh. yeah. So I'm from. It's it was another podcast I did for a really long time, and sometimes like um, I fumble over my words. And we're, we're talking about a thing, and we're talking about a story that happened in Kentucky. And I was like, in Kentucky, and my man's was like, for about oh. two years, he was like. Now we go to Kentuckus. I was like, oh, 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 oh Kentuckus. I had to hold off on it because you said, I was like, oh. Oh, no. I don't know what. Kentuckus we don't know her. <laughs> so going back a, a bit, um, you know, could you, you know, share how some of those maybe early experiences with with art, with with filmmaking and growing up in, in Louisville uh, shape your creative voice? And when did you realize that filmmaking was going to be it for you, was going to be one of the, the interests for you? Yeah. So in high school, my dad, uh, Shaka Lafayette, he bought me randomly a 
old analog Minota film camera. I was visiting him in DC and um, he had randomly had this Minota camera. So my dad moved between like DC and Philadelphia where he spent most of his time in Philly. So I kind of like partly grew up in Philly. Um, just, you know, mostly the summers and holidays. So uh, it was a trip that I was coming to visit him and he asked me what I think about photography. And he had, had a, a note Minota camera in the back seat that he <laughs> reached over and, and gifted me. Mm-hmm. Now, I had, n- I had no idea what photography was, you know, this was also high school for me. So we're talking digital cameras or, you know, household things that are really small things that you kind of just like snap, you know, mostly family events and things with in my world. So for him to pull out a old analog (laughs) film camera was definitely a new thing for me in my world. It actually really opened my world up. I then began learning about photographers like Gordon Parks and I joined the photography club in high school and really just start thinking about the world and images and like every, I, you know, you know, it's like, I guess like, yeah, 17, 18 starting to really develop a genuine interest. And this was images and like, I started even thinking about black people differently. I'm starting to photograph my family and yeah, see the value in, in albums and moments. Just photography really shifted my perspective in that way. Yeah. And, you know, shortly after joining that photography club in high school, I'd gotten admitted to Howard University. And it was there where I truly, you know, began to blossom and my love for photography and images also like just continued to blossom um my freshman year I ended up making a documentary you know with this like rebel canon rebel like t2i kit that my like folks had gotten me you know that Christmas (laughs) that Christmas but my freshman year at Howard um, I had a class, um, I had like a diasporic, like, you know, like some sort of like, um, diasporic class in high school taught, taught by this professor named Dr. Krista Johnson. She, who also, you know, really changed my life in a way of just affirming, um, uh, my storytelling from, from, from early. So yeah, I had this class that she I was teaching and um, instead of me writing like a 15 page paper, she challenged me to actually make a documentary for like the final grade. And I was the only one presented with this option, which was actually pretty amazing. So I went out to the streets of DC and I'm like, you know, as a freshman, I was a little bit of an introvert. You know, I really kind of used the camera to, start conversations but really it was like a safety thing for me it was like if I'm carrying around the camera you know this is like I'm safe I'm good like (laughs) yeah so I was like being challenged to open up to in another way where I'm rolling around DC with this like camera and and my freshman roommate at the time and we're asking questions um to look to like you know DC natives about um actually it was like hiv and aids that was the class and so we're asking people about like the epidemic and yeah so essentially that project ended up being my first like short documentary i I got an a plus on it the class clapped when i presented it i I edited it on my my hp computer i can't even remember the name of that software Um, um but yeah so essentially that was that was the the intro that was the intro to it so it's like also growing up in louisville having you know in terms of aesthetics i think like there's nothing like a kentucky sky Mm. there's nothing there's nothing like growing up in a big family where you're where you're used to aunties and cousins running around and wrestling and there's a real lived experience this like super embodied 
coming from a big family in the South, like who gather, who love each other, who, who function healthily, um, who have a good time. And I do think that also, you know, having parents who live apart, all these things really do play and have played a huge part into my interests and my eye and my, yeah, my aesthetics, you know, my, my father who, you know, I was coming, going back and forth from to Philly to, to visit his mother. My grandma um, is a Mississippi woman. Mm. So that means my, my father is a, a Mississippi man, right? <laughs> He's a Southerner too. Um, although he was born in Albany so, you know, these just these little details are really big details, you know, that do inform not only who you are, but what things you see, like what, what catches your gaze. It all informs your gaze. So I'd say yeah, my, my, my background does absolutely inform my gaze even today. Thank you. That's that's really great. It's really thoughtful and, you know, makes me think of just when I go to different cities, I'm looking for I'm, I'm Baltimore through and through even though people say you don't <laughs> like it and uh when it, when I go to a different city I'm looking for that familiarity from my, mm -hmm. my upbringing like what is it about this city that has me you know if, if let's say if it's a Philly I'm, I'm seeing some Baltimore and if it's New Orleans which that's like New Orleans is like my side piece that, it, it's oh. real. like I love <laughs> New Orleans oh, wow um, but Same. I look at it, I look at it in that way of like, oh, I can see myself here. I can mm -hmm. see my, myself being here and these are the reasons. And it's really pulled out. But I consider myself and my, my experience is very much a mid-Atlantic guy. But it's something about that sort of Southern sensibility that's, that's there that clicks for whatever reason. And as, as you mentioned, you know, like I think about my some of my some of my my family here. We're all from here, except for my grandmother. She's from like North Carolina, or she was from North Carolina. <laughs> and mm -hmm. those sensibilities are there. And I'm like, oh yeah, we kind of country in that part. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that <laughs> and it's it's just there. And then like my mom's people from Southern Maryland, I was like, oh, y'all country too? And it's like, yeah. it's not the South, but it's like, y'all kind of country. It's like, all right, cool. We got it. <laughs> and I just see some of these things that are norms for me that I think everyone up here does it. It's like the further you go up that is a detachment and almost sort of it's not intentional and it's not with malice, but it's, it's just people aren't connected in that way. I think mm -hmm. as the further you go up. Nah, yeah, no, nah, absolutely. I, I, I would have to agree with that actually. I mean, I've been in New York like nine years now and I won't say it's disconnected, but it's just definitely not the same as the South. <laughs> yeah, It's definitely not the same as the South. I mean, the, there's definitely love here. And I mean, a place like New York and Philly, uh, there's, it's, well, I will say more New York is definitely a romantic city. And there's a lot of, oh yeah, a lot of love just in the streets and in the air, but the South, yeah, it's just a different <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like, um, it's almost like passing a certain test of like, you really from here? Cool, you in. Versus <laughs> you're down there like, and, and I'll share this before I move to the next question. I remember the first time I went to New Orleans, I was there by myself. I was going yeah. through like a, a crappy breakup and this was like sort of money I had left over instead of visiting the girl I was dating. I was like, eh, I was going to go to New Orleans because yep. uh, Hannibal Burr said a joke about it. That's the only reason I went. <laughs> and I remember going to like one of these wild markets, like, I don't know, it's a Piggly Wiggly or something. They have these names, right? And oh, yeah. I'm sitting there just trying to like get my bearings of where I'm going to go. And it's this random dude that popped over wearing like the whole chef fit. And I was like, What's up with my man? And he sits down next to me. We have a 45 minute conversation. You would thought me and him were like boys. And oh. he told me about his family and all of that. And I was like, yeah. situation wouldn't happen further up. Yeah. I'm I'm a shy extrovert, I guess. So I was like, I don't know you, bro. But we had a really cool conversation. I remember that trip. That's like 10 years ago, more than any other experience that I've had. There's been some cool ones, but I remember mm -hmm. that one very vividly because of that sort of familiarity. He's a basic wow. guy. I was like, I don't know you, bro. <laughs> I appreciate the sentiment. I appreciate that sort of hospitality, I guess. Oh, totally. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of hospitality, a lot of love, a lot of loving people, and it's great. So let's let's talk a bit about process. And you know, as you you, you touched on, I saw some of those those interconnected things that, that are there, having the having the eye, having the background, um, having the interest. So 
Let's talk about where those like, you know, curation, filmmaking and photography, like where they sort of complement each other within the, you know, your creative process. Oh, absolutely. Um, funny enough, you know, in like 2018, I think. Yeah, about 2018, I sat with myself and I asked, OK, honey, you you love you love film, you love you love. Um, you know, gathering people, you love music, you know, I come from a very musical family. So again, talking about those early years and I'm thinking, okay, how can, what ways can I bring my interest together? Mm. And I came up with this, I came up with this name that is not something I invented, of course, called black science fiction, thinking about what are these things that combine my interests like what what are they and I, and I this this phrase black science fiction this genre black science fiction really sat with me and I'm like you know what maybe I can gather maybe I can gather people and program and curate under the name black science fiction so I did and I began curating music shows and um, hosting film screenings um, through Black Science Fiction. I developed this Afrocinephile club where I rent out like um, this old, well, this like you, this, a, a space that actually used to be a funeral home turned uh, indie theater yeah. in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And I program cinema series through there, through the Afrocinephile uh, club that I, created um via black science fiction so this is a vehicle that i've used to combine a lot of my interests um this black science fiction you know is definitely a brainchild that um is as much a, a indie art house i like to say where i'm giving room for artists to experiment myself included <laughs> i mean selfishly you know gathering and and developing the muscle to organize, which is in my bloodline, you know, to do, organize and and present art and build community and, you know, and practice, really practice. It's all a practice, part of my practice. So that that is one, that is definitely one way that I've been preserving and growing and developing through Black science fiction. Thank you. That's it's a great, like, look, we had to have that post conversation. I feel like I'm going to have to get some mentorship, you know, you know I mean? <laughs> bring, bring together, bringing together those interests. Um, you know, it's almost like you, you can't go wrong. It's, it, it's, it's very simple there. I think it's just like you bring together the things that you're, you're interested in. I think it almost in a ham fisted way segues to this, this next question I have hmm. yeah, thinking through like creativity. It isn't just about making what, you know, um, yeah. often it's in making what you connect with deeply on an emotional level. And, hmm. you know, I've seen and, and read that your work, you know, has a focus on black culture, some folklore in there, you know, hidden histories hmm. and, even, you know, going back and talking a bit about sort of what's often in plain sight at, at when you, your time at Howard, right? Mm -hmm. So talk a bit about like the, th you know, why do these themes resonate with you personally and what draws you to this type of story versus something that might be more, yeah, someone's done that, but I'm gonna put my own stamp on it. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for this question. So I grew up, well, one, my name's Imani. <laughs> my dad's name is Shaka. You know, I grew up, you know, I would say, especially my paternal side, uh, are 100 percent Pan-Africanist. I grew up with a bunch of black children's books that were really rooted in fantasy. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, I mean, even beyond like my own creativity for the first nine years of my life, I was an only child before my little brother came. <laughs> I was an only child, so I got really good at playing, you know, alone in a lot of ways. I was I was more a quiet child. I did grow up with cousins and all of that. But um, I really loved, like, science and, like, I collected things like rocks. I was very, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, was, I don't know what kind of child you'd call this. My grandma always talks about, about it, how interesting it all was. But... 
Yeah, I really just had like genuine interest from young sure. where things like just really interested me, like that might not interest the average child. But I mean, this really led to even me storytelling and like I would um, draw a lot and like create stories from like a really young age and um, not only narrate them but not you know just like use material i was like using like material like toilet paper and fabrics and putting things into books and gluing so i was always really hands-on and um, again grew up with folklore books you know um virginia hamilton's um the people could fly them you know just was a, a huge staple but just a range of of fantasy books and i think that's really manifested itself in my adult life in really beautiful ways. Also, again, um, on my paternal side, I, I grew up with a grandma who told a lot of stories to me and my cousins, like also just a singing woman, a, a very musical woman um, who always had a story in her song that, that's also influenced me greatly. So I think now, you know, as an adult, as someone who is very interested and in, like in love with storytelling, I always go back to my roots and to, and to not only just what I know, but like what I thought I knew and then like what I'm rediscovering all the time. Like, you know, as we grow every year, as we change every year, um, our understandings of things change, you know, and I'm always reaching back. I'm always reaching back to roots to to reprocess things, rethink about things and just find out and and hold on to more more so like hold on to who I am and who my people are, who I come from and um really kind of just remembering um yeah, remembering how things feel. Like, you know, I've been again in, in the North now for poof, you know, essentially from 18 years old onward, and I'm 32 now. So, you know, I, you know, spent four years in DC and then, I mean, almost 10 years in New York and done a lot of traveling elsewhere, <clears throat> you know, essentially outside of that too. And um, there's still no place like, Louisville, Kentucky, and there's still nothing like those children children's books that I still have under my childhood bed or like my bed at home at my mom's house. And like when I'm coming now to like when I'm coming to the table now as an adult, as a young filmmaker, um, as a mid career filmmaker who has something to say, and I want to tell a story about a community in Louisville, Kentucky. Well, now I'm going to pull from Virginia Hamilton because, you know, I'm thinking about, well, what do I want to say about Louisville, Kentucky? And I, and I'm really referencing a film that I, a short film I just made um, called the people could fly about um, essentially about the history of roller skate culture in Louisville, but more so looking at roller rinks, um, as sanctuaries and how they emerged throughout the years in Louisville as safe spaces, as really deep community spaces. Mm. Um, so, of course, when I'm approaching this work, I'm, I'm going under the bed and I'm, I'm remembering, OK, what parts of my childhood can I bring with me? And, you know, what elements of a space maybe as simple as a rink to most could I make magical because it's already a magical thing. And I'm like, okay, well, the people could fly. Like the people in here are flying. I mean, I grew up roller skating as did my mother. And, you know, if I'm like approaching new work, um, I'm thinking, how can I bring ancestors into this work? You know, yeah. how can I bring childhood into this work? Like, um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm always going inward in that way and uh, reapproaching things with, with that lens and that gaze. It's just really important to me and it's it's what's most natural. So, you know, you know, outside of that too, just even when I'm making photographs, 
making photographs, when I'm making images or what catches my eye might be how the sun is hitting a building, no matter where I am in the world, be it Johannesburg or Flatbush, but maybe something reminded me of what a sunset feels like um, in the grass in Kentucky or um, maybe I'm like walking around Prospect Park, but I'm really thinking about like, I'm really thinking about home and how it feels to be in the backseat laughing with your cousins. And so I'm always kind of just like taking like childhood things or things that feel most like home into the work because it's the most authentic part of myself, I think. Thank you. Um, you're making my job easier. We're, we're tapping into, we're poking that sort of what the, the next few questions are about. Um, so, so thank you for revisiting that. And you, you, you got me not to say my goofy, I had a pun I was going to throw in there, but I'm not going to, <laughs> I'm going to. It's something, about, it's something about you having denizens and, you know, it's just like having your people, cause you know, your name and yeah, see, fell flat. See? <laughs> yeah. <You> uh-huh. silly. <laughs> but no, no, that it, it's, it's great when you, you're able to, and there's a few comments I want to make. You're, you're able to, you know, and I think you're right. The the authenticity piece is so, so important. It's before we get sort of beaten down with rejection or whatever the thing might be. You're just doing whatever the thing is that you do and hearing about like sort of how maybe you got your 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 first um, your first camera or things along those lines. It reminds me of how I stumbled into recording audio was you know, I was trying to impress a girl. I did a rap song in character as Beowulf. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. And I wow. did it with all of these DJ Clue-ish ad libs. Wow. And what? I had one of those teachers who was like very supportive and she played it for the <laughs> class. I am this color. I've not gotten any darker. I was red. I was like, oh, <laughs> this is embarrassing. But she thought it was cute. And she was like, oh, what's going on, Murder Mac? And that's what she was calling. I was like, I'll take it. Oh! You know, it's M-U-R-D-A, you know? <laughs> and, uh, Murder Mac! <laughs> so we ha- hearing about that, my parents are like, we need to get you a small recorder. Because I got one of those, like, old dubbing machines. And I recorded on an old dubbing machine. I was a tinkerer, right? And my parents got me the little handy recorder. So for a while... I would walk around and just click, you know, note to self. And that's probably proto podcasting for me. It's probably, hey, mm-hmm. let's get this story. Let's not forget this thing. Or even with my friends, we would, you know, hang out in the basement during the summer. Um, this one summer that comes to mind, my uh, my dad used to work for the city, city, uh, city of Baltimore. And it was one year where uh, Sammy Sosa from the Chicago Cubs uh, had a, um, a cereal mm-hmm. Like it basically knock off Frosted Flakes. And mm-hmm. my dad found a case of them that fell off of a truck. So that's what we <laughs> ate every day during that summer. So we would sit there loaded with sugar watching wrestling. And I was recording the conversations we were having as stupid teenagers. But that was probably one of my earliest wow. dives into what a podcast would be. And that's 24 years ago. Wow. Yeah. It's, it really starts like with the family. Like... Just like those things that are just regular parts of your makeup that you don't really even see as things until you reflect on them later. And you're like, hold on. Actually, (laughs) I've been an archivist like most of my life or like. (laughs) Right. Right. And I've been recording conversations with people and I shouldn't have been for a long time. I've been making an ass out of myself for a long time. Um, No, but it's 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 really important to, you know, tap back into when we were younger. There's something there. And um so, so moving back into the people could fly, you know, highlighting those those gathering spaces. I'm reading that the the time frame is from the '60s to the mid 2000s. So, mm-hmm. why that time frame? What was the significance there? And sort of secondly, why is it important to preserve and, if you will, archive these these stories? Yeah. Well, the '60s to the early 2000s. So. Definitely the the early 2000s was because that's when I was that's when I was in the rink, (laughs) you know, that's when I was in high school and the ritual of the Friday night, you know, Saturday roller skating was huge when I was a teenager. It was definitely 
its own world and a place where it felt like teenagers were safe. Like, I don't know what's happening now in the world. It's in shambles, but the rink was definitely one of those teenage spots where kids could go and be kids and also like, you know, be away from their parents, have some sort of freedom and, but like it was a container to like explore, but it was safe. It was, it was really special. So I really wanted to highlight that, um, you know, put my own voice into that, into the film in that way. And, you know, as early as the sixties, because, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, we're talking now, you know, a time of a segregated city, especially in the South. And I think it's an important fact to include in a film, especially a documentary, especially when we're living in a world now where there's like book bans and like fake news. (laughs) I think like it's important to, yeah, to talk about you know, what people had to sacrifice to get to what I experienced in the 2000s. (laughs) So that's why I thought the time period was really important. In the film, we talk about busing and how the first Black roller rink, well, one of the first Black roller rinks, Broadway roller rink, where my mom was a skate guard as a teenager, um, you know, it, it opened up the the same year busing was um you know put in place in the city so it was very high racial tensions at this time where a black family um, was empowered and created such a beautiful place for families to enjoy themselves you know admit amidst this like really crucial part of kentucky history you know, where like schools are just integrating and people are just learn like trying to figure out like, you know, where in the city is safe zones. Because again, um, yeah, it, it was uh, in the segregated South in the 60s is a serious thing. So, um, yeah, I wanted to include make sure that there was a range to really like talk about what people sacrifice, what family sacrifice, what, what black people, you know, encountered, you know, just give a broad scope of the past and juxtapose to the present just to see maybe what has changed and what has stayed the same. That it's thank you. It's, it's really good. And I think you're, you're right. I was going to say something about the fashion, like some of those fits over, you know, those yeah. four decades, but no, no, I think it's, it's really important to capture like what's happening what the, well, what has happened the sentiment and your, your point around sort of what it was then and then mm-hmm. seeing like where it's at now. Um, and I think sometimes even talking to, you know, folks who were around that time, like my, my dad's 70 and, I remember it was maybe 2019, you know, here in Baltimore when we had the unrest or what some people Mm -hmm. call riots. Mm -hmm. And my dad was like, oh, no, none of that stuff's been fixed since 68. He's like, I don't know why they're acting like this is new. Yeah, I hadn't touched that in, you know, 50 years. Wow. I wouldn't have that reference point because I wasn't around then. So being able to have someone who was around for that time and saying, Pretty much their branding this and like you guys did. It's like, no, 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 this has been blighted. This is intentional. Mm-hmm. They don't care about what we have here. So I think it's important to have those stories actually have some semblance of truth versus something that's rebranded of we've always been this sort of city. Yeah. This sort of community. And then, <laughs> you know, we lose something there. We lose that connective tissue and that DNA that's baked into who we are. Absolutely. I agree. And so you know, this last little point out of this question, um, what, mm-hmm. what would be the key thing you want folks to take away from from this film when you, they check this film out? You know, I, I really just want people to have learned something new about Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I want people to walk away, too, with a just a better understanding, too, of the importance of spaces like Robin's Roost or spaces like Broadway Roller Rink, you know, if you if you see the film, you'll understand just what kinds of 
communities are built um or what yeah what kind of communities have been built in a small town like Louisville that people might not talk about or hear about much outside of Kentucky Derby or Muhammad Ali I really just want to I want to I want people to be interested and care about the city I want people to visit I want people to pour into the infrastructure of the city um yeah I want I want I want Louisville to be a place on on people's lists and I want folks to watch the film and want to go skate or um just even just have a better understanding of again the importance of these spaces and hopefully you know return to their own communities and or in search for places that feel equally as good to them uh, yeah that that would be that would be the ideal but again just such a privilege actually to be telling any story about my hometown i think Filmmakers don't always get the the pleasure to to do that. So I'm really just thankful at all to just make work about Louisville and like a place that I also like grew up frequenting as a teenager. Um, it's really it's really special to me. It's, it's a special. It's it's important, and it feels I would imagine it feels really good to really do it for the home team, do it for the city, and. You know, I carry that on me. I, I don't sound like I'm from here, but I carry that when I go. So I'm from Baltimore, man. I'm from East Baltimore. I get real specific. It's like, yo, Baltimore's not that big. I'm like, I'm from East Baltimore. Exactly. <laughs> ah, yeah, you gotta, you gotta say it. You gotta rep. You gotta rep and get real specific sometimes. <laughs> and and you know, and I and I, you know, thoughtfully when I go to these different places, I come with like all my best thing, you know, repping where I'm from, but also just like, look, I, I do this. I, I do this professionally. This is a thing that I'm interested in. And, you know, really almost as an ambassador of, you know, hey, you should check this out. You should yeah. you should check out Baltimore from this. It's all of these great things here. Don't listen to the the other stuff. You know, that's a small part, a small slither of what the full story is. And it's an invitation, really. Um, yep. So there's one other thing I want to say about, you know, about, about the film, right? Yeah. Um, you're in your bag. You know, I, I see, you know, archival footage, still photos, and some new material. So that's like, you know, what was that like? Like really executing sort of multiple facets of your diverse skill set. What was that like? And really with that energy of putting on for your, for your city and your hometown? I mean, it's absolutely a pleasure to 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 put on for the hometown, like to, to make work and you have articles like from your local news stations, like writing things about you and publishing it and having extended, extended family members and uh, friends of your family, like reach out about it. You know, you become a, a champion like in that way. And it, it's truly no feeling like it, especially when you come from a small town or from like, an unsaturated space. Like I'm not from New York city. I'm not from a, a, a town, like uh, even Philadelphia or Chicago or LA, you know, I'm from Kentucky. So I feel like a possibility model for a lot of people. And I think we all need that. Like a possibility model is in um, younger cousins. Uh, you can look at, at this film and say, dang, Monty did this. Like, Monty made this, you know, um, or even people older than me. You know, my grandma always calls and reminds me um, that, she, you know, she didn't have these opportunities when she was when she was young. So she's just always proud to see the opportunities that I've taken advantage of. And, yeah, it's a it's a it's a beautiful thing. It's it's something I, I don't take for granted. It feels really good. Also, even the material that I use for the film, the archival, um, a lot of it came from archives from um, historians who are in the roller skate community. Like a lot of that archival footage are from like, you know, roller skaters who have been skating for like 50 years <laughs> and had a bunch of footage essentially in their basement or in their personal collection that they wanted to be in the film and that I wanted to be in the film. So 
you know, very collaborative in that way, too, where it's kind of like, wow, like this is your art. Now I'm like, you know, there was a a part of the process where I'm sitting in an elder's basement and his set office set up going through all these archives that he's documented for literally the last 50 years. And he just did all on his camcorder. And now he's passing them along to me to say something else, you know, with the, with the material. So there's a really deep, deep exchange happening here where like, I have an idea and concept. I come with material and then I'm, I'm sitting with the elder who also has material and we infuse these things to say, to say one thing about a community or to say multiple things about a community that we've both, that we both have different entry points into. So it's super magical for that as well. And I'm excited for him to actually see the film. Although I did show him an early cut, um, months before it was complete but i'm excited because we haven't had our first screening in the city yet so i'm extremely excited november i believe yeah november 24th is the screening um and i'm so excited to see everyone's face and just to hear the energy in the audience and just to see people celebrate this document because the film is a historical document now where, you know, people are now almost immortalized. It's like, this happened, you know, like this happened, you know, and like nobody can take it away. We have records. So I think all of it just, yeah, it means so much to me. I'm really like thankful. That's great. Um, Thank you. And so I think since that's a good spot for us to kind of wrap on the real questions. So yeah. I want to move into these rapid fire questions that I got for you. You can't escape. Everyone's kind of Oh, good. man. Okay. All good. <laughs> as I tell folks all the time, you don't want to overthink these. Whatever's the first thing that comes to your mind. It's like, look, I said what I said. This is, this is <laughs> Fine. All right. uh, so, you know, with the, the name of films and references to, to books and stories. So mm -hmm. if you could fly, what would be the first place you'd fly to? Ooh, the first place I'd fly to would be Johannesburg, South Africa. That's a great answer. Um, could you name one song that's in your current music rotation? I was listening. You're music people. Ooh, in my current music rotation. It's funny because um, on my way, I'm, I'm sitting in Harlem right now. And, um, ooh, sorry. And, and, you know, one thing, like I've been creating a gospel playlist, not that I'm like a, I'm not really like that religious or anything, but um, there's a leak in this old building is a, is a song that I actually by LaShawn uh, Pace hmm. um, is like a song that I, I'm just definitely in my rotation right now, which yeah, again, like I'm a big R and B jazz, like I love the early two thousands cuts. Um, but this just happened to be like a bit in rotation. So yeah. It's good. This is the last one I got for you because you kind of already answered this other one. I was just like, I already got the answer. I was just like, what, what? Uh, if, let's see, hmm. if this film is, <laughs> all right, that's the way I wrote it. If this film is on, regardless of how long it's been on, wh what are you watching? Are you watching it? Like, you know, let's mm -hmm. say it's a movie that you're, you're a big fan of and it's just like, all right, just halfway through. I might as well finish it. What's that movie for you? Oof, there's a few, but I'm going to say there's a movie. So you're saying there's a movie, it's on, and I don't want to finish it for real, and I'm just powering through it, or I no, want to... you want to finish it. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm hooked. It's like, oh, it's like five minutes left. I got to finish this. Oh, Ooh. it just started great. I can watch this whole thing now. Oh, I'm going to say Rush Hour 2. That was unexpected. Shout out to you. That's, that's <laughs> a good, good pull there. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Full of, full of tricks. <laughs> I was I was looking for a comedy. I was like, okay, it's gonna be a comedy that pops. You know, you can tell your people. <laughs> yeah, rush definitely. I'm a, I'm a, I love a rush. I, I I just need to actually revisit that. But anytime it's on, I'm like, oh, we here, I'm chilling. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, and, and that's kind of it. You got off the rapid fire, off the hot seat, as it were. Um, Ooh. so there there's two things I want to do as we close out here. Yeah. One, I want to thank you for for spending some time with me, some of your afternoon with me. This has been a treat. 
And um, two, I want to invite and encourage you in these final moments to share with the listeners all of the details, the social media, you know, when the film is going to be, all of that stuff. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you again for having me. It was such a pleasure and an honor. Um, the film is out and about. The People Could Fly is um, doing a festival run right now. It will be playing at the Speed um, Art Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, um, November 24th, if you're local. Um, but also we'll be playing the New Orleans Film Festival, um, Hot Springs Film Festival, and Doc NYC this fall still pending other festivals but please catch it there um also social media things imani nikaya is my instagram that's imani nikaya <laughs> nikaya is n-i-k-y-a-h imani i-m-a-n-i um that's me that's my social media and yeah i think that's about it there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Imani Denison for coming on to the podcast and sharing a bit of her journey with us. And for Imani, I'm Rob Lee saying that there's art, culture, and community in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. Mm-hmm.